Welcome again. My name is Jai Thomas. I'm the Assistant Coordinator Strategic and Consumer Policy here at Energy Policy WA and I've got the pleasure of emceeing this session. We have a packed agenda highlighted by a special guest, the, that is the Honourable Bill Johnston, MLA, Minister for Energy, who I'll shortly hand over to to say a few words, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll just give an introductory uh, statement and then, uh, and then we'll get into it. We've had a fantastic response to this session, uh, interest from across Western Australia um, and nationally. So in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community here in the southwest of Western Australia. That is, uh, we are on Noongar country in the Perth region. It is the Wajak people of the Noongar nation that are the traditional custodians. Uh, on the plains and scarp of the Durbel, Yerrig and the Swan River. I've been lucky enough to grow up in the southwest and learn about Noongar history and customs. I've learned we're in the season of Jilba, the months of August and September, a time of pink and yellow flowers, Coolbardi, the magpie swooping, the gently warming weather, and more recently, the finals of the ball game the Noongar people call Gen Ball. It's a beautiful time of the year and I'd like to pay my respects to Noongar elders past and present. So the next slide, Keely, uh, to get into the agenda for today, I'll hand to the Minister shortly. Uh, as noted, we have um, Aidan Barker of Energy Policy WA talking us through the EV Action Plan, our plan for integrating EVs into the power system and readying the power system for their broad uptake. Um, Aidan will then hand to Dave Fife and Nathan Price from Synergy and Horizon Power respectively to talk, talk us through the EV charging network location and these two themes really bring together uh, the state government's energy transformation strategy uh, and uh, and the state's electric vehicle strategy. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll have Q&A uh, and we'll aim to finish around 3 p.m., albeit we might go a little longer. Uh, like all of these forums, questions are encouraged under the Q&A function in the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, we'll start with questions that are that are voted up. So please use your democratic right, hit the thumbs up on the question and, uh, and get the ones you'd like uh, answered to the top of the screen. Uh, we'll endeavour to get through as many questions as we can. Um, I do forecast going a little over the hour mark. Uh, we've got four different present or four presenters across four different locations and so I'll direct Q&A accordingly when we get there. We only have Minister Johnston for a short period of time. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to the Honourable Bill Johnston, the Minister for Energy, to make some introductory comments. Uh, over to you, Minister. Thanks, Jai. Um, I too acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the Noongar people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, so many people for joining us today from wherever you are joining us uh, from. The McGowan government is preparing the electricity system for the future. That's what the energy transformation strategy has been all about. Part of that is getting ready for electric cars. We know that uh, there's an expectation that 20% of new car sales in Australia will be electric by 2030. And we know that an electric car charged from the electricity grid in the southwest interconnected system Will produce 30% less greenhouse gas emissions than a conventional petrol vehicle. So I'm really pleased to be here today to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on the Electric Vehicle Action Plan, which is part of our preparation for the electricity system to be ready for the uptake of EVs. We all know the uptake of EVs will continue strongly I've personally spoken with the different car manufacturers uh, and they're telling me that they're moving away from internal combustion engines. They're saying that they'll only be producing electric vehicles in the future. And that means uh, that we need to be ready for that. We need to see that we'll no we know these prices for these vehicles will come down and we need to be ready for that. And the government is working to de deliver the key work needed to facilitate the uptake uh, and prepare our system for these new low carbon future. The, the EV Action Plan has been developed as a recommendation of the Distributed Energy Resources Roadmap, which was released in April of last year. 
the DER roadmap was the first deliverable of the energy transformation strategy, which I launched in 2019. Implementation of the DER roadmap is, ex is going exceptionally well. In addition to the EV action plan, the McGowan government has also delivered community batteries. We're progressing with the introduction of our first big battery to the Swiss. We're trialling new tariff structures. Uh, we're trialling virtual power plants and more equitable access to DER uh, through our Smart Energy for Social Housing program. Electric vehicles like DER present a magnificent opportunity along with real issues to be managed. They have a real opportunity to support the transformation of the electricity system. I often say that uh, what we need to do is plan for the first 100,000 EVs, not the first 100. And this is what the EV Action Plan is all about. We're, we're, we're making the decisions to future-proof our grid and he help reach our target of zero net emissions by 2050. I'd like to thank Energy Policy WA, Western Power, AMO, and all the other stakeholders for contributing to this pathway to zero emissions. And I'd also like to thank everybody that's online today for participating in this important and exciting presentation on our EV action plan. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to I guess, give us a, an introduction to the EV action plan. Uh, soon I'll hand to Aidan Barker, but I'll get, I guess I'll just point out uh, the question and answer field in your top right. Uh, do put questions in at any time and we'll keep them uh, voting up um, to the end of this. So, uh, Aidan, I'll hand to you now to uh, talk us through the EV action plan. And once you're finished, I'll ask you to hand to Dave and Nathan to talk us through the uh, the charging station locations. Great, thank you, Jai. Um, so, as Jai said, my name is Aidan Barker. I'm the Director for Electricity Networks and Customer Participation here at, at Energy uh, Policy WA, and I'm going to provide a bit of an overview today around the EV Action Plan and its contents. So, next slide, Kelly. So what even is the EV Action Plan? It's probably a good place to start. This is the, the blurb from our website, but in a nutshell, it's a set of 26 specific time-bound actions. That is, uh, it's not an aspirational plan. They're actually actions that are allocated to individual parts of the government with uh, timeframes around them that we need to get them done by. Um, and they come with two main objectives, which is making sure that EVs are efficiently and safely integrated into the power system and that we're facilitating and accelerating the energy transformation that's already underway in WA, um, which the Minister for Energy referred to just before. Next slide. So the EV Action Plan isn't going to achieve it by itself. The Minister's already mentioned a couple of other things. Uh, it's been developed as part of a broader vision of government and it recognises that electric vehicles are a distributed energy resource or DER. Uh, DER are usually those smaller customer owned and operated devices such as rooftop solar and storage. And while they're relatively small, usually by themselves, when taken together, they can make a pretty big impact on the power system and we anticipate that the same will be the case for EVs. So recognising the central role of DER, the state government released the DER roadmap in April last year, 2020, which spells out the things that we need to do between now and 2025 to achieve a vision with DER's core part of the power system. Customers can, can continue to benefit from installing and owning a DER and the transition to a low carbon power system is accelerated. Um, more specifically, Action 16 of the DR roadmap identified the need for us to urgently kick off planning to integrate EVs into the grid and make sure that the grid's ready. The other context for the EV action plan is the state EV strategy, which was released in November last year. And amongst other things, the state EV strategy specifically called out the important role of the DR roadmap and Action Item 16, and the need to explore uh, incentives for customers to make the best use of all of the solar energy being produced in the middle of the day. 
Next slide. <clears throat> so you've heard the minister mention it, and now you've heard me mention it too. What exactly is the energy transformation? Um, when we talk about the energy transformation, we're actually talking about something pretty specific. It's a, a vision for the future of the power system in WA or power systems in WA, uh, which are at the heart of the government's energy transformation strategy, which was released back in May 2019. With the energy transformation, uh, large and small renewables are the main sources of generation in the future. We anticipate supported by energy storage, and this underpins the policy that we're developing both for um, distributed energy resources, DR more generally, and for EVs in particular. What we see is in this future, energy is going to be distributed rather than being centrally generated and you know, transmitted from large generators through to the source of demand. Um, customers are going to have a cho the choice to install devices in their homes and businesses like solar, batteries and EVs, which will be a core part of the power system. We also anticipate that batteries of a range of sizes are going to need to be required to help store the, the cheap energy for use at other times of the day. Uh, what enables this DR and, and decentralised future to work is customer devices like rooftop solar and batteries working together in concert. The minister referred to virtual power plants before and that that's the, the nomenclature that we use. Um, it's the orchestration of these devices that will make sure the power system is operating efficiently and lower cost by making sure that those devices work together. And further to what the minister said, uh, electric vehicles aren't just cars. They include a lot more storage than most household batteries will. And because of that, they're going to play a central role in the future envisaged in the DR roadmap. Uh, and the EV action plan is how we're going to do it. Next slide. So looking under the hood, the EV action plans well aligned with the DR roadmap. And those of you who are familiar with that document will recognize those themes that the, the various actions are grouped under. Uh, I'll just go through them quickly and provide a bit of an overview. Actions under the technology integration theme are about making sure that when we plan, build and operate the power system, we're doing it with electric vehicles in mind. And that means we've got to have visibility of EVs and EVs have got to be part of our planning processes and that the right technical standards need to be in place. The next theme is the tariffs and investment signals theme, and that's about making sure that customers and industry have got the correct pricing information that they need to make good investment decisions. And so that this applies to EVs and charging infrastructure. Next is actions under the DR participation theme, and these are about making sure that we understand how EV technology can work in concert with other DR as part of virtual power plants. So working together uh, for the good of customers and the power system. And finally, actions under the customer theme are about understanding what's driving customer decisions and behaviour as EVs become more available and what, if any, additional consumer protections might be needed. Next slide. So in, in, in thinking about integrating EVs in the power system, the, the first thing in question that often comes to mind is, uh, and I've seen these in the questions that are, are coming up as part of the Q&A, is how much we're likely to expect and by when. Um, I'm just going to say that looking at forecasts over the last decade, uh, it's shown me that trying to predict exactly when EVs are going to take off uh, in the same way that technologies like rooftop solar did it, is potentially a bit of a mugs game. And that can be seen in the most recent forecasts from the CSIRO published uh, by AEMO, that's the Australian Energy Market Operator, which is the operator of the power system in the southwest of WA. Um, what we can see looking at this graph is that there's a pretty wide range of uncertainty regarding EV uptake, uh, a big difference between the high case there in light blue and the low case in, uh, in black. Um, what we can see here is over the next decade, you know, we might see anything between 50,000 EVs on the road to nearly up to 700,000. And as I'm sure you can appreciate, there's a, a pretty big range of impacts on the power system as part of that. Due to that uh, high level of uncertainty, and think about the EV action plan and how we put it together, uh, we wanted to make sure it wasn't a plan for a specific number of vehicles on the roads at a specific, no a specific time. And so the, action, the idea is that the actions under the plan sets up for the future, no matter what under that range of scenarios. 
uh, actually comes to fruition. And that's why Western Power and Energy Policy WA are working together to determine sensible uptake scenarios and looking at likely charging behaviour and then integrating those into processes such as Western Power's network planning processes and the government's whole system plan, which looks out over the next 20 years to understand the needs of the power system. Next slide. So important to developing these planning scenarios and making sure that they make sense is understanding exactly what customers actually do with EVs in practice. As we can see from, from this graph, um, what you do with an EV depends largely on what you're using it for. Um, this is important because where and when customers charge really matters for the power system. An increase in demand from EV charging in the wrong place at the wrong time can result in increased cost for everyone through the need for network infrastructure upgrades uh, and it can also contribute to peak demand, which has impacts on generation costs. So in this graph, again, we can see from AMO um, that based on the limited number of EVs that are on the road today, uh, that different types of EVs, customers have got pretty different charging behaviour. Commercial vehicles might be able to charge more uniformly during the day, while residential consumers are more likely to charge in the evening, which is coincident with um, total system peak. Under the EV Action Plan, Energy Policy WA is going to be looking at how we get better visibility on where and when customers are charging. At the same time, Western Power and Horizon Power are going to develop more sophisticated models regarding the impact of EV charging on particular parts of their grids. Um, leveraging work underway as part of the DR roadmap, Western Power is also looking at ways to provide better signals to EV chargers to utilise the existing network infrastructure through the use of variable variable limits um, applied called dynamic operating envelopes. <coughs> Next slide. But even while Western Power and Horizon Power are learning more about how customers use EVs and integrating the uh, power planning processes, does note that EVs and charging technologies continuing to change in exciting ways and evolve quickly. And we can see that evolution here on this slide when we look to the present on the left hand side and emerging on the right. Um, we're going to be seeing pretty substantial changes in both technology and behaviour of customers over the next few years. So on the left, uh, we're looking at a situation which is it's more likely to be what you would see now. Passive charging where an EV customers more likely to plug, plug their car into a, a, a low ampage wall socket or perhaps maybe a slightly faster charger with the power going one way, so from the grid to the vehicle. Increasingly though, customers are going to control the timing of their charging through the use of smart chargers and take advantage of incentives such as new tariffs and also try to better align uh, their charging behaviour with the output of their other DER and use of the other DER like solar and batteries. Moving forward a few years, we expect to see changes in inverter and um, charge control technology that allow customers to use their car battery to actually power their own homes, uh, working together with their rooftop solar. And finally, eventually, EVs will be able to be part of virtual power plants, so orchestrated alongside other DR like rooftop solar and storage to support the operation of the power system and provide value to customers. <laughs> So these improvements in technology are going to open up new possibilities for customers and the power system. However, like the Minister said, with technology uh, evolving fast, product standards also need to keep up. And responding to this, the EV action plan's got actions for Western Power and Horizon Power to make sure that gaps in standards are filled and that national processes for standards reflect WA needs. Let's note that this is going to be particularly important in the case of Horizon Power, which operates a large number of remote microgrids all across WA. Next slide. So further to this, Horizon Power is looking at how EVs interact with microgrids through its trial in Onslow, uh, which involves the control of rooftop solar batteries and electric vehicles. And already this trial is showing real results on how DR can small, support small microgrids, uh, which often have quite high costs to, of supply because of their dependence on diesel generation. The need for these trials is fairly urgent in Horizon Power's area because of those costs. 
um, potentially more urgent than for Western Power's network. But under the EV Action Plan Energy Policy WA, Western Power and Synergy are also looking at the need for a trial of vehicle to grid technologies with EV be, being part of a, um, a virtual power plant. Let's say the, the timing and form of any trial uh, that we do will include consideration of all the other activities that were already taking place under the DR roadmap. And that in particular includes Project Symphony, which is the WA government's flagship DR orchestration trial, which is now just really kicking off in earnest. Next slide. So the prospect of EVs being part of the power system along with DR is pretty exciting. Um, however, like the minister said, we've still got some short term challenges. Uh, the graph we can see, see here uh, shows the demand on the grid, a sort of idealised demand curve throughout the day, depicting a nice, sunny, mild spring day, such as we're hopefully going to be having later this week, um, and how that might change over the future. And what we're seeing is that as rooftop solar has increased, demand from the grid from customers in the middle of the day has gone down, gone down a lot. In fact, in mid-March, we reached a record low for demand on the power system, as you can see on the graph. And in one sense, this is a sign of our success. Um, rooftop solar is great, provides opportunities for customers to save money and also reduces the, the carbon from the power system as a whole. However, those low load situations are increasingly creating challenges for the operation of the power system, mostly because the large scale genera uh, conventional generators, which are needed to deal with emergencies, aren't able to run under those conditions because there's no demand for them to meet. So talking about low load, that's a new challenge. But again, as pointed out in the graph, uh, peak demand hasn't gone away either and new records are still being set. So because of these so-called uh, duck curve challenges uh, of low load and system peak, nicely illustrated here by our beautiful Madagara Bridge uh, crossing the Derby Yerrigan, we also have opportunities with EVs coming online. Under the EV Action Plan, Synergy will be developing new tariffs for EV customers to incentivize this, that plentiful solar energy in the middle of the day. And this will help with low load and potentially also peak as well if we can shift uh, customer charging times. Western Power is also going to be looking at new network tariffs to promote system friendly EV charging and will make the application process for installing fast charging infrastructure clearer for proponents. This is going to help unlock investment in that infrastructure and we know that infrastructure is important. We know its availability is a very important consideration for customers when they think about buying an EV. Next slide. Okay, last but not least, customers and the customer theme. So customers are central to the EV action plan. Um, in fact, I'd say that all of the EV action plan actions are actually ultimately about customers, um, but they've got their own thing within the plan as well. And that reflects that while EV uptake is currently small in WA, we've got a need to better understand what drives EV customers uh, what's important to them and what they're going to need from the power system in the future. So under the EV Action Plan, Energy Policy WA is going to look at the customer journey from the beginning to end and understand how data from uh, EVs as part of that journey can feed into the planning processes and how those processes can be made easier for customers. New EV products, technology and private charging networks also mean that existing customer protections are going to need to be reviewed to make sure they remain fit for purpose. Energy policy is going to lead the way in that review uh, in the context of its broader thinking about how electricity uh, is, is retailed through charges, privately owned charges. And finally, customers are going to need information. Um, and to provide that best information, Energy Policy WA will plan a program of research to understand how customers value EVs and how this affects the way electricity tariffs and other products are going to be structured in the future. And with that in mind, I'll pass on to our next speakers. Next slide. So we've got David Fife from Synergy and Nathan Price from Horizon Power to talk about the new EV charging network. Yeah, thank you, Aidan. Um, I think we'll just click to the next slide. Thanks, Keely. Um, so Synergy and Horizon, um, really excited to be part of this uh, project. Um, so Nathan and I will just give you a, a brief overview of the 
EV charging infrastructure project that the state government announced in uh, mid-August. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So one of the actions out of the electric vehicle strategy was investment in an EV charging infrastructure across the state. And August was a significant milestone for this project when the $21 million investment was announced. Um, so this is a, a really exciting project to be part of. We're going to be developing and installing Australia's longest EV highway across 45 locations, um, stemming from Kananara all the way through Perth, down to Esperance, east into Kalgoorlie. Um, so a, a very extensive project and, and, and a really exciting one for not just Western Australia, but Australia. I think there'll be a lot of learnings across the eastern state seaboard as well from this. So it's a significant project for Horizon Power and Synergy. I do want to also acknowledge um, the incredible work that Western Power will be a part of this as well. They're absolutely critical to this project. So we're going to have 45 locations across the state, no more than 200 kilometres apart. And um, yeah, really exciting um, investment by the McGowan government that we're um, going to start rolling out. Tenders will go out towards the end of this year and installation early 2024 completion. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the project mm -hmm. investment um, objectives, obviously to stimulate the uptake of EVs in Western Australia, create that EV charging network, uh, which is absolutely critical to the uptake of EVs, you know, support travel and tourism in Western Australia, increase economic opportunity for some of those local communities, so each location will be a sort of tailored um, installation, depending on the town, the land, the infrastructure available. Um, customer end experience will aim to be very positive, including a user friendly billing platform, real time information on an app, which will show you when charging stations are available. And, um, you know, again, very reliable. Um, installations at each of the locations, which Nathan will sort of talk to in a little bit more detail next. If we can go to the next slide, please. So rough timeline, as I said, um, we'll start probably going out to tenders as a joint working committee with Horizon Power and Synergy. And so we work very closely together to get the best economic outcome for the state and, and also ensure that both organisations learn as much as we can through this whole process tenders out towards the end of the year and you can see there that we'll you know we'll have a, a staggered um, construction schedule over the next couple of years and go and fully operational early 2024. So a, a really exciting opportunity um, I think I'll, I'll at this point pass over Nate, to Nathan just to go into a bit more detail and what the charging stations look like and what the customer experience ultimately will be. Excellent thanks Dave. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nathan Price and I work at Horizon Power. Um, I was involved in the development of the WA EV infrastructure business case. So in terms of the proposed locations for charges, these are identified based on the findings of the uh, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Strategic Planning Report, which was produced by UWA for the WA EV Working Group. So as seen in the Electric Vehicle Charger Map on the right of the slide, the proposed locations are situated approximately 200 kilometres or less apart, and this is to support regional travel and ensure as charges are accessible and help us to reduce range anxiety. So as part of the project, the utilities will work through a process of stakeholder engagement and consultation in order to identify sites suitable for the deployment of charges. Next slide, please. Customer experience is at the forefront of um, the charging sites we will look to select. So in doing so, we'll consider things including situating charges clear of traffic hazards, um, adequate security and lighting, suitable parking arrangements, proximity to amenities such as public restrooms, cafes, restaurants, and proximity to retail businesses, information centres, areas of local or cultural significance, <laughs> and park nature reserves. Uh, the last two points are particularly important given the balance of charges we're looking to deploy are uh, proposed to be in regional areas. So this really gives us the opportunity to cite these charges in areas that showcase the towns and support regional tourism. Next slide, please. 
So a few key points on charging stations. Uh, there'll be a minimum of two charges available at each site, and this will provide redundancy and support growing demand for EV charging. Uh, this is a fast charging network, so at least one unit will be a DC fast charger of 50 kilowatts or more at each site. Um, the decision on specific unit sizes deployed will be informed uh, by the procurement process later in the year. Um, the preference is that DC chargers will be equipped with two charging cables and the ability to charge two cars at once. Um, and this comes from a customer experience perspective, but enables more EVs to charge at once. And this leaves users to explore the area or take advantage of nearby amenities um, while their vehicle is charging. And lastly, there is a minimum of two parking bays dedicated to EV charging with additional parking bays available for spillover. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, David. Thanks, Aidan. Thanks, Minister, for talking us through the EV action plan and the charging station location. We, we got through that in slightly quicker time than we envisaged. So, uh, but the good news is we have a heap of questions to get through. Uh, at this point, I'll just point out that the, uh, the slides will be sent out after this event. Um, so you will receive that in your inbox sometime in the next 24 hours. Um, and I guess I'll just make a broad comment that the EV action plan really seeks to guide the integration of electric vehicles into the power system. So the focus of the action plan is on those questions um, or, or on those actions that we need to ready the power system for 100,000 EVs. So some of the questions floating through will be probably more broadly under the banner of the state EV policy and we um, or state EV strategy, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer those. Um, but again, you know, our focus is really on on the power system and readying the power system. Um, so uh, we'll jump into the questions and I'll just direct them uh, as we need across the, the three locations. Um, and I'm aware we also have Gus Riggs from Western Power uh, on the line to answer any uh, any Western Power specific questions. So uh, the first question there is from Marty and Joondala. Is the WA government considering EV purchase incentives similar to those in Victoria and New South Wales, approximately $3,000? I think uh, the minister's made it clear uh, both in electric vehicles and household battery storage that uh, incentivising or providing a subsidy directly um, is not on his agenda and not on the government's agenda. And ultimately it's up to car vehicle manufacturers to uh, to start to bridge the gap between their current pricing and, uh, and more competitive pricing. Um, and so again, the focus here is on readying the power system for that uh, rather than and incentivization policy. Next question is from Anonymous, uh, who I'm sure will feature prominently through Q&A, uh, but it's, uh, Anonymous asks, when will WA government electrify its fleet and electric buses? Uh, I guess that's a, a really a feature of the WA EV strategy, which outlines a target of 25% of government vehicles by 2025, and more specifically on buses, um, articulates that they'll commence a, 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 an electric bus trial in Joondalup early next year, uh, the Joondalup route having uh, a five kilometre loop and, uh, and a high voltage EV charging system to be installed um, soon um, that would then um, allow for that sort of trial of electric buses. Uh, also uh, aware that, uh, that the, the state government supply arrangement for buses through Volvo has flexibility in it to essentially pivot towards electric buses should the outcome of the trial prove that that's a really good idea, which I'm sure it will. Um, next uh, next question, please. We've uh, obviously got many people working behind the scenes on this, so we coordinate. Um, so scroll down there. Sam, how anonymous is it to encourage smart rather than non-smart EV charging to avoid convenience charging impacting on the grid as EV uptake increases? I think that's a great question from a broad perspective, you know, we want to incentivize use of the power system in a way that's efficient. As Aidan said, um, the belly of the duck, the Matagarrett Bridge Curve um, is, uh, is a real thing and where we can incentivize the use of um, EV charging during the middle of the day when we do have excess renewable energy, um, that's a good idea. So I might ask Aidan to sort of talk to that question a little more and then maybe hand to Nathan um, to give us a bit more uh, on smart versus non-smart EV charging. So um, in terms of how important it is, uh, I think the answer is it's really important. And while I'm not going to talk about any numbers today, 
um, part of the EV action plan is about Western Power and Horizon Power doing that work around those scenarios that I was talking about earlier um, to look at what the actual costs are. In some instances, if we do nothing and people were to just charge when convenient, um, but initial indications are those costs are pretty substantial. So um, in answer, it is important. And in terms of that incentivization, it's going to have to take a few different forms. Um, already there, there's a product out there in um, synergy service area for EV customers. Uh, we're looking at having that fine tuned as one of the EV action plan action items uh, to be more consistent with the actual cost of supply and, and incentivizing the type of behavior we want. And like I said earlier, the technology is also going to come to the party as, as part of this as well. It's not just good enough to have, um, have the tariffs there. You've also got to have the enabling technology that helps customers respond to those. Um, so having smart charges in place where customers can sort of set and forget uh, is going to be important. And finally, having it integrated as part of virtual power plants. So having some degree of control with the permission of the customer. Um, for them to participate in broader orchestration of, of DER. I think it's actually not just one thing, it's going to be all of those things acting in concert. Thanks. Hey, Nathan, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> um, yeah, I suppose so. It's Nathan Kirby from Western Power here. Um, I suppose just echoing what Aidan mentioned, um, that orchestration is key to um, the future of the power system. Again, Western Power's done um, some analysis around different scenarios to try and understand what the impact of a high penetration of EV is on the um, electricity network, particularly given that uncoordinated charging during peak times. Thanks, Nathan. We've got an abundance of Nathans here, so we might keep going. Um, will there be a rollout, Chris Jones from AEVA, will there be a rollout uh, of workplace EV charging infrastructure this year? If so, how many? Um, I guess the state EV strategy uh, has a commitment for uh, funding available to government agencies uh, for uh, charging uh, infrastructure to be installed. That was uh, made available from 1 July this year, and there's 20 active projects in the government sector uh, that, that are being deployed at present. Um, I might ask Dave Fife and Nathan from Horizon just to comment on um, on charging locations in, you know, in sort of private workplaces. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the investment that we've announced here is, you know, is public infrastructure paid for by the state government. I think you know what we're hoping is that that will as that gets rolled out and the electric vehicle uptake increases that it will stimulate private investment in workplaces and car parks etc from that point onwards um but that that's really down i think to uh, the, the private sector as much as it is for for ourselves and, and horizon power uh, government policy essentially so i mean you know if we can get this rolled out and get the uptake increased um, then hopefully we'll, we'll see a, a lot more rollout through the public infrastructure as well. I don't know if Nathan's got anything to add there. No, I think you covered it off quite well. OK, uh, next question, uh, just scrolling through those. If the manufacturers are only going to produce EVs and no more ICE vehicles by 2030, why is the proportion of EVs only projected to be 20% of car sales by that time? It's really a forecasting question might I actually throw that towards Western Power, Gus and Nathan. Uh, do you guys have a comment on that? Oh, thanks, Joe. I think um, Aidan alluded to it quite well during the presentation that you know these are forecasters and there is inherent degree of uncertainty. Um, and one of the key things that you know we've been uh, keen on and, and EPRA and Horizon and Synergy is being prepared for a high uptake, high D uh, future. So we're la laying the foundation through this EV action plan uh, to prepare for an EV future, whatever that uptake rate may be over whatever time frame. Thanks, Gus. And you know, I suggest, I suspect our forecast will be continually <coughs> refined with the best available information uh, at the time, uh, including in our next whole system plan, looking at you know what the vehicle manufacturers are committing to in terms of their uh, their roll off from uh, internal combustion engines. Okay, next question there from the 
very cleverly titled audio and video are clear and working. Is there a plan to have EV slow charges alongside street parkings and street lights? What consideration is being provided for apartment building dwellers that have no access to home charging? So I might send that to Nathan at Horizon Power. Sure, yep. Um, so currently just we have allocated or proposed certain locations. Um, so generally speaking, we'd be looking at um, while no site's been um, agreed on, we'd be looking at public areas. Um, they could potentially be next to streetlights, as you've suggested, or they could be in other locations. We haven't yet um, landed on the specific sites. Um, and any comment on you know, how apartment building dwellers that have no access to home charging? Yeah. Well, I might just talk to that very briefly. And it's something that we've already Receive some interest from from consumers in particular and bodies corporate who are in charge of running apartment buildings. Um, and the answer kind of uh, relates to the points I was making about consumer protections into the future and our thinking around the electricity licensing framework and, and how um, people can on sell energy in, uh, in a site like an apartment building. Um, so those sorts of situations will be part of our consideration. The idea being to make the framework easier for bodies corporate and apartment building and building owners to install that kind of infrastructure and recover costs appropriately. Thanks. Hey, and I might just see if Western Power have anything sort of further to add to the uh, to the notion of uh, of apartment buildings or other private dwellings, you know, installing their own, own charging infrastructure. I think um, obviously we're seeing a, a greater interest in EVs, um, sorry, EV charging going into apartment buildings and embedded networks. And I think nothing stops those uh, strata owners from connecting to the network. And we have the processes in place to help enable those connections. So it's something we're very excited about seeing more in the future. So in simple terms, uh, an electric vehicle charger uh, in a private dwelling is a lot like any other appliance. And there's a you know, connection process through Western Power. Um, um, that you can go through. Uh, the next question is from Anonymous. What is the political or the potential accumulative economic benefit of EV uptake for WA given much of electrical infrastructure is in state hands? WA is a petrol importer and running cost for customers is low. Does this all add up to less money for foreign oil producers and more money creating jobs? Does the answer inform state investment to accelerate uptake? Has this model fantastic question i think you know ultimately we've highlighted through this presentation from a power system perspective electric vehicles are a great opportunity to really help maximize the efficiency of our power system and the renewable energy resources that we have and the renewable energy output that we have at present and into the future uh, from a whole of state perspective um, you know there, there are a range of activities everything from the ev strategy through to our future battery industry strategy um, and other initiatives to really try and take advantage of this opportunity. Again, the focus of the EV action plan is really on making sure we're ready uh, for EVs in the power system such that we don't uh, turn an opportunity into a major risk and need to spend a lot of money upgrading the network or other things to, uh, to ultimately uh, make EVs uh, work and have them integrated. Next question from Anonymous, has thought been given to making EV charges contestable loads, allowing choice of retail? Would, would, this would encourage innovation in tariffs that incentivize behavior that aligns with market signals and re reflect power system needs. I think the, the latter comment is uh, very applicable and we certainly through this EV workers fire to have you know, tariff structures that incentivize the right, uh, the right use. I'll just ask Aiden to sort of comment more broadly on, on, uh, on, on that. So I suppose in, in reference to the first part of the question, the, the government's um, uh, not indicated any reconsideration of the contestability threshold for residential customers. So uh, you know we're concentrating on making sure that Synergy has that those incentives to innovate there and uh, able to offer customers with choice um, around their tariffs, including for EV tariffs as well. But Jai said um, as well, having making sure that they're aligned with the needs of the system is important. Uh, in terms of daytime charging for uh, workplaces, which was mentioned previously, those customers are already likely to be contestable customers. Um, and so I'd you know, encourage the, uh, the retail market 
the contestable loads and WA to come to the party and offer those innovative products to customers. Thanks, Aidan. Uh, next question is in a similar vein on tariff structures. Uh, and anonymous notes the current Synergy EV tariff is 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. and we've spoken a lot about the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the, the time-based dynamics of the power system and that duck curve, uh, ultimately. The, uh, the benefit of load to the power system in the middle of the day um, uh, is much higher than the uh, than the tariff structure currently signals for. So uh, will that tariff structure be uh, reformed, Aidan, I guess is the question. Yeah, so that, that particular tariff um, was put out there as a pilot back in 2018. Uh, the intent was that it be a pilot, so to test how consumers responded and the evidence has shown that they actually do respond to price and people have changed their charging behaviour to take advantage of those savings. So as part of the EV action plan, our next job is to look at those tariffs and make sure that they actually fit the needs of the system. So using that power during the middle of the day and having prices that uh, provide incentive for customers to do that. So yes. I uh, guess uh, while we're talking tariffs, I might just pass to Dave and uh, at Synergy and Nathan at Horizon to just comment on uh, on tariff structures going forward uh, in their uh, utilities. Dave, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think it's well, well articulated by Aid, and obviously um, during the middle of the day, there's uh, an abundance of solar and wind, and um, and at the moment, not a lot of not a lot of places for it to go. So we want to, you know, really incentivise the the consumption during then, and not at the peak time, and when everyone gets home at six o'clock. So, you know, we work closely with the needs of of the customers and also with um, Western Power from a network point of view as well. And so it's uh, ongoing sort of policy decisions that will take place over the over the coming period. Yeah. See Nathan eagerly trying to get off mute there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to, just to add to that. Um, Look, we'll be developing the pricing model uh, going forward um, collaboratively with Synergy Horizon Power, Western Power and EPWA. Um, we'd just be looking to support the uptake of uh, electric vehicles with consideration of a uh, range of other issues, so current market pricing structures and the local costs to supply electricity at specific locations. Thanks, Nathan. Our next question is from Bruce. I can see Gus is taking matters into his own hands and replying to that post, but I'll ask it anyway. A uh, key requirement of EV charging, uh, of an EV charging network is system availability. Bruce notes the recent experience is showing Margaret River charging station was offline for about a month and the closest alternative 60 kilometres away. With more EVs, uh, the need for surety in charging station is vital. So I guess the question to Western Power and then Horizon Power is what steps are being taken to ensure uh, ensure availability and redundancy and, uh, and those kinds of requirements? I'm happy to kick this off. Um, sure. so as part of the development of the business case, um, it was all centered around customer experience. And one of those is ensuring a high availability of um, the high availability of the charges. Uh, so as you work through the procurement process, we'll be looking at um, putting in place operating and maintenance structures um, that enable us to respond quickly when charges do have faults or issues. Um, secondly to that, we'll provide um, one or more charges, so sorry, two two or more charges at each site. Um, so this just provides that extra degree of redundancy um, in the event that one charger isn't available. Um, and lastly, the charges we'll look at um, through the procurement process will be um, suited to our varied operating conditions. So certain areas have high temperatures, humidity or dust. Um, so we'd be looking at deploying infrastructure that's suitable for the, um, for the varied operating environments around Western Australia. Thanks. I think uh, I think that summarises it quite well. Uh, so we move to the next question. About ten minutes left, um, and a, a few questions to get through still, but we'll keep plugging away. Uh, Julia asks, will there be incentives, grants for local government to convert EV fleet vehicles? Uh, again, uh, incentives uh, through the state government and are not currently part of our, sort of our policy agenda, and we certainly look to the federal government to sort of more broadly support incentivisation of EVs. Uh, next question from Anonymous. Any idea what form of charge is likely to replace the fuel excise? Again, that's more of, a, of an energy, uh, sorry, an EV strategy question. And it's not something that we're seeking to tackle in the, uh, 
in readying the power system per se for its transition. Um, so a little out of scope for us, albeit a very meaningful issue to, to, to address uh, more broadly. Um, Anonymous says, any views on using EVs to soak excess solar during the middle of the day? I think uh, we've covered that pretty well. The government's energy transformation strategy more broadly really seeks to tackle uh, the system low issues caused by solar uptake. EVs are a fantastic opportunity in that and the DER roadmap and this EV action plan are all about really trying to target that, that outcome. Bruce asks, following on from 20% EV required by 2030 to achieve net zero by 2050 requires EV rollouts to 60%. It's well behind this target. What is planned to encourage greater take up? Again, that's an incentivization question. This um, program's really about readying the power system, having all the ingredients in place so that we're ready for EVs. Uh, when the price points arrive um, and you know incentivization policies may come in the future but they're not currently part of our work program. Luke asks soaking up midday PV generation will probably require a lot of charges in the CBD to charge commuter vehicles. Is there any work underway to encourage retrofit of charges to existing parking garages or installation of charges in new developments in the city? I might hand to you Aiden on that one. Yeah, so I was actually just going to hand that one over to Western Power, but I, I will say um, that you know I'm in agreement with a lot of the comments that have been made uh, about um, making daytime charging easier for commuters in particular. Um, and I just note that in the CBD, we've got a, a lot of existing infrastructure that can serve that demand uh, more easily than it can perhaps if everyone was to be charging at the same time in the distribution network out in the suburbs. Um, so, it, it, but in terms of, um, I suppose that that actual process, I'd kick that over to Western Power. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Thank Thanks. you. Um, so, our, our colleagues at Horizon and Synergy might want to make a comment, but we think this is one of those great examples of how sector coupling is going to be really important for the power system um, and decarbonisation going forward. We think there's a great opportunity for either existing car park owners or even our colleagues at the PTA with their train stations to leverage those existing assets to provide additional services to our community. And I think going forward, it'll be increasingly important from um, an employer perspective as part of their employee value proposition, what ancillary benefits they're providing to employees uh, going forward and offering that EV charging service will be key to that. Um, we're obviously, you know, through the action plan and our existing processes, have those processes to enable uh, customers to upgrade or modify their grid connection uh, if they want to go down the path of offering charging point services at existing facilities. Thanks. Uh, we'll move to the next question. Uh, what will the power level be for each charging station? Nathan and Horizon, do you want to sort of comment on? Text yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so minimum uh, 50 kilowatt units um, within Horizon Power's network. Um, we operate across many different microgrids, um, some of those being quite small, some of them being quite large. Um, so in terms of um, constraints, we have distribution constraints and generation constraints. So in certain areas, we are um, we are limited to some degree in what we can deploy, um, and especially at any of the off-grid locations, it starts becoming quite cost prohibitive to install anything um, beyond really a 50 kilowatt unit. Um, but then potentially there will be um, either AC or DC charges um, as redundant units as well, just to support EV uptake and um, and yeah, providing a bit of redundancy in, in um, issues when there's issues or faults arising. I guess to take Marty's question then uh, on 50 kilowatts and whether that's enough, um, by the end of say 2024, what flexibility do you have, Nathan, to uh, I guess upgrade these uh, this charging infrastructure over time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, while we haven't formally gone yeah. through the procurement process, um, when we did engage informally, with, sorry, um, when we did engage informally with uh, suppliers, there were a number of units where. Um, they provide the opportunity to scale up the unit, so you don't need to actually replace it. Um, there will just be capacity within it, so you can purchase additional sort of um, slots, um, so you can upgrade to meet the uh, the demand as it as uptake occurs. Thanks. Um, 
Next question. Uh, we might just scroll through these as quickly as possible. I see Ian Porter from San. Oh, it's gone from me. Can you get bring that back up, uh, Sam? Uh, scroll down the other way. <laughs> uh, Teams is a great tool, and uh, we've got people across multiple locations. It's uh, all hands on deck. Ian Porter asks, is there any hope of electric vehicles participating in the reserve capacity mechanism or for providing essential system services on the Swiss? You know, the DR roadmap really highlights a future where customer devices are able to play a significant role in supporting the power system, whether that's being paid for capacity or um, a being uh, able to provide those essential system services that firm up the power system at, uh, at times when it needs it. Um, so I think the short answer is yes, uh, and the long answer is you know that will be part of our DR aggregation and participation framework and rule set that we're working through over the next couple of years. Uh, paying for EV capacity to be available will have some complexity to it, um, but we certainly look forward to taking on the challenge, um, including uh, such things as uh, you know, testing vehicle to grid technology and uh, and the services that electric vehicles can provide to support the power system. Next question is from Tony at Dan Derrigan. Uh, will the EV charging stations be on public land or could they be located on existing service stations? Uh, Nathan at Horizon, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, certainly. Um, yep. We conducted a bit of initial stakeholder engagement just on potential locations. We haven't locked in any specific locations yet, um, but initially we did have a preference for public land, just given um, risk reduction and better ease of deploying charges rather than on a private, privately owned land. Thanks. Uh, well, I've got you. Can you comment on uh, bi-directional charging and when that'll be available for residential and fleet owners? I can't specifically um, talk to bi-directional charging, um, but I yep. we are looking into it um, as part of a project um, in Onslow just to trial it. Um, yeah. When it's ready for the public at large, I'm uncertain. I think you know a lot has happened in particularly the last 12 months on electric vehicle manufacturers looking towards vehicle to grid services. It's certainly something um, that has uh, had a lot of momentum behind it over the last 12 months. It's something that we actively considered when we wrote the DR roadmap and actively look forward to trialing and piloting as the as the vehicle manufacturers themselves come to grips with uh, using batteries and exporting from uh, from cars into the power system to support the power system and uh, and the services that come from that and the move to, uh, I guess, going beyond just providing a vehicle for their customer. Uh, next question that I can see there, uh, what mix of technology is envisaged for the EV highway charging station? Uh, this will be the second to last question. What mix uh, of technology, nozzles, ROC, et cetera, it's always a good acronym, is envisaged for the EV highway charging stations and what lessons are we taking in from Europe? Um, Nathan at HP, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so in terms of um, the charging nozzles, in development of the business case, we looked at the current state of the market, so which EVs are um, currently available in WA, uh, which ones are on the road. That was to inform our, um, our initial concept that we would sort of look at having both chargers um, to enable you know the people actually out on the road to charge their vehicles. Um, going forward though, there could, there could potentially be a, um, we could be looking at two CCS uh, nozzles. Um, that'll be informed through the uh, procurement process of the tender and the uh, EOI. Um, I, I'm not really in a position right now to speak on specifics, um, but the uh, our, our team delivering the project will, will be able to inform, um, will be more informed later in the year. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, I'll just look for one more question, then we'll uh, call an end to it. So what have we got there, Sam? Um, Anonymous asks, is there an ability to have free fast charging through public charging network for those that don't have at home charging? There is a company that's rolled out in the SA and New South Wales. Um, Dave, do you want to sort of tackle that and then maybe hand to Nathan at HP? Yeah, look, a, a, a lot of this is um, dependent on the, the private sector as well. Um, you know, I think we, we get this project up and running, um, continue to engage with community customers and the, and the private sector as time goes on. 
Um, I've got no doubt that these things will will appear as, as demand increases um, as part of the wider offering um, for car parks or um, shopping centres, etc. Um, but at, at the moment, it's not something on the radar, but I, I can see it happening. Excellent. All right, well, uh, I might go back on my word and just have another couple of questions because there's a couple of great ones around network augmentation there. And I, know, I can see Nathan at Western Power really nodding his head ready to answer it. So uh, I'll just get you to scroll up a little bit there, Sam. Uh, so Anonymous asks, how much grid augmentation do you foresee over the 45 proposed locations? And are localised peak shaving storage facilities expected at the remote location to support the necessary load? So I might start with Nathan at Western Power, then hand to Nathan at Horizon Power to talk about those remote locations and their needs. Nathan at WP, you want to go first? Yeah, thanks, Jai. I mean, that's an excellent question because obviously certainly some of these locations are at um, some more re remote locations. So one of the things that we are looking to do with Synergy um, is for those sites that within the Western Power footprint is to work with them to try and optimise the location of the EV charging station such that we're really minimising the grid augmentation that is required to be able to support this, um, the charging stations. So in terms of actually any additional facilities, um, in terms of storage, I suppose that is still something to work through, but certainly in the first instance, trying to provide as an efficient connection as we possibly can. And Nathan HP. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we'll be looking to deploy, um, so not just diesel generators, we'll be looking to deploy um, solar battery solutions, um, standalone power systems. Um, this decision was based on just aligning with public sentiment um, and, and the state government's direction. People don't want to charge their vehicles um, solely on fossil fuels. Um, so especially in the early days of uptake, um, you'd probably foresee a lot of the charging in some of these locations um, during the day just to be captured by the solar and battery. OK, thanks, Nathan. We'll, uh, we'll call an end to it there. Uh, a few questions that we didn't quite get to, but I certainly encourage you to uh, get in touch. Our email address is on uh, on the screen at the moment, so uh, feel free to reach out if we didn't quite cover the question that uh, that you ask. Um, and we'll obviously also send out the slides after this session. Um, so do get in touch. Do download the EV action plan at the uh, Brighter Energy Future website that's listed there as well. At this point, I'd like to thank uh, Aidan Barker from Energy Policy WA, Nathan Pryor at Horizon Power, Dave Fife at Synergy, Nathan Number Two, Nathan Kirby at Western Power alongside Gus Riggs, and thanks to uh, Sam and Keely behind the scenes for making this all happen. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your afternoon to, to join us. Uh, it was uh, much more of a discussion in the end, a great number of questions, and I hope we got um, to, a, you know, all uh, to meet all of your your needs in the Q&A session. Um, and, uh, and again, if there is anything you'd like to further engage with us on, do reach out um, to, our, uh, to us at Energy Policy WA on that energy transformation uh, email address. So thanks again for tuning in and, uh, and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.